Hi, this is Joe Chaffin and this is a Blood Bank Guy Podlet. Today we're going to do a 10 minute tutorial on why we irradiate blood products. And really the answer is very simple. The answer is to prevent transfusion associated graft versus host disease. That is the one and only indication for irradiated blood products. And you need to know about TAGVHD. It's a brutal diagnosis. It's awful, generally fatal. Patients die fairly rapidly and thankfully it's rare. It's defined as an attack on host tissues or recipient, blood recipient tissues by trans fused T lymphocytes that go along with a platelet or red cell or granulocyte, for example, transfusion, cellular blood products. It has damage to the skin, liver, GI tract, and mucous membranes, but the most important thing about transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease is that it wipes out the bone marrow, and that leads to fatality with overwhelming infections, generally in a month or so down the line uh, after transfusion. Clinically, patients get a characteristic rash on their hands and feet uh, that moves to the trunk eventually. They get damage to the epidermis that you see here, and eventually they'll get damage to the, to the gastrointestinal epithelial structures with uh, lymphocytes damaging those or invading those, uh, those glandular structures there and lymphocytes invading the portal areas of the liver. Uh, but again, the big deal is that bone marrow that should look like this turns into this, and you have a wiped out hypocellular fibrotic bone marrow, which leads to significant immune system damage. TAGVHD is a febrile delayed transfusion reaction in the, in the, uh, the, the uh, classification scheme that I use. You see it right there. It typically presents about 10 days in, but anywhere between 10 and 30 days in, most commonly with a fever. So you shouldn't expect to see TAGVHD during transfusion. It takes time for it to develop. It can occur in either immunosuppressed or immunocompetent patients, but I want to take you through the immunosuppressed patients first. Let's imagine a normal transfusion. If if the blood donor and the blood recipient are not HLA identical, in other words, if they're not identical twins, then the transfused T lymphocytes, the lymphocytes that go along with a cellular blood product, are going to go in, look at the recipient's HLA type, and say, hey, that's not me, and they're going to try and mount an immune response, and you can see that there. Fortunately, most of the time, patients are able to counterattack that. In other words, the patient's immune systems are healthy and vigorous enough that the, that the recipient's own cells can look and see that these transfused cells are foreign, counterattack, and in addition, call in other T lymphocytes to counterattack and overwhelm these transfused cells, and it's no problem. However, if for whatever reason the patient, the recipient is having some T lymphocytic dysfunction, either temporary or permanent, and these T lymphocytes don't want to do that counterattack, or if the patient is lymphopenic and simply doesn't have enough of those T lymphocytes to counterattack, well then you can see what's coming. Transfusion associated graft versus host disease can happen because these transfused white cells, transfused T lymphocytes can attack, recruit other white cells, and, and cause significant damage through cytokines, and a, a whole complex uh, array of interactions that can occur. Again, the bone marrow is the big deal, and that's the biggest problem. The sequence involves the transfusion of viable T lymphocytes, HLA incompatibility between donor and recipient, and a recipient who either can't, as we've already shown you, or doesn't respond. And the doesn't respond, you need to understand, because this can happen in immunocompetent people as well. The first two are a little less common, so I'm not going to talk about them, the fresh product thing and the cardiac bypass thing, though they're important. But I want to focus on the one-way HLA match. This is something that occurs most commonly in family members that are giving blood one to another, but can also occur with HLA matched products. And this is this is how it works. You have a donor who's homozygous for a particular HLA haplotype, the A2B7 haplotype, a recipient who shares one of those haplotypes but not both. In that situation, the, the, which is called a one-way HLA match, the transfused white cells go in, see that A11B12, and try to mount our, our initial attack that I showed you before. However, the, the recipient's own cells look at the donor cells and see only HLA haplotypes that he has. So he's not interested in counterattacking. You can see what happens, recruitment, proliferation, and the potential for TAGVHD in a completely immunocompetent recipient. So how do we get around this? Either with immunosuppressed or immunocompetent recipients, the way that we prevent this from happening is irradiation. And irradiation simply takes T lymphocytes and turns them into something that cannot attack 
host tissues. It's just that simple. You can work, it can be done in one of several ways with standalone gamma irradiators in the blood, in the, the transfusion service or in the blood center, standalone x-ray irradiators, and increasingly people are using linear, linear accelerators that are used for radiation therapy. Ultimately, in the future, we're going to do pathogen inactivation for at least some of this, but that's a topic for another day. Here's, a, here's an illustration of a standalone gamma irradiator that shows a cylinder in the middle. Uh, but I also want to point out to you that these RADSURE indicators are, are important to recognize. We are required to show that the product truly was irradiated when we are trying to irradiate it. So the RADSURE is attached to the, to the blood product. After irradiation, that not irradiated on the sticker should change into irradiated, and that's a QC indicator. Here's just a, a picture of a linear accelerator that you should be aware of that it's used um, for radiation therapy normally, but we can also use it to do what we do. And what we do is we give a dose of 25 gray to the center of the bag in the United States with a minimum of 15 gray anywhere in the bag. We can't go over 50 anywhere. In the United Kingdom, they do a higher dose. The minimum is 25, the maximum 50 again. Um, why do we do all this? Well, again, to prevent TAGVHD, but who is at risk? Here's the list. And, and when I say universal agreement, it's about as close to universal as possible that pretty much everyone agrees that patients with T-cell defects, whether acquired or congenital, patients who are getting hematopoietic stem cell transplants should get irradiated blood products. The same is true for babies getting intrauterine transfusions or premature babies less than 1,200 grams. Patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, because there's an inherent immune immunodeficiency from Hodgkin's, and the last two revolve around the HLA one-way HLA match. Transfusions from blood relatives and quote-unquote HLA matched products are more likely to give you a one-way HLA match so that if you're immunocompetent, you could still get TAGVHD. Everyone, as far as I know, irradiates granulocytes for reasons that we've already described, but uh, most importantly, they're fresh, they have lots of T lymphocytes, okay? Uh, fludarabine is a drug that affects the immune system, and again, people should get irradiated products if they're on fludarabine. Most people agree that neonatal exchange transfusions should be irradiated unless, uh, well, especially if intrauterine transfusion occurred, and most people irradiate blood for patients with other hematologic malignancies other than Hodgkin's disease that are being treated. Some people irradiate blood products for patients with solid tumors like breast cancers, et cetera, that are getting intensive therapy. There are certainly cases of neuroblastoma uh, that are where the patient was being treated and developed TAGVHD. Some people will irradiate for fresh whole blood and cardiac surgery patients. That is certainly a minority. And, and again, many places won't irradiate for any of these on this slide. Certainly, we have pretty widespread agreement that solid organ transplant recipients don't need irradiation, even if they're immunosuppressed pharmacologically. And normal small volume transfusions to neonates probably don't need to be irradiated unless the baby had an intrauterine transfusion. Interestingly, patients with HIV AIDS don't need to get irradiated blood. Uh, there has never been a case reported of an HIV AIDS patient getting TAGVHD, and there's a, a lot of potential reasons for that. I should also call your attention to the fact that this is for cellular blood products that have not been frozen. So FFP, cryoprecipitate, uh, and even probably frozen thawed red cells probably don't need to be irradiated, uh, and most people don't. Finally, a, a couple of details I want to mention to you. Leukocyte reduction is commonly used in the same patient groups that, of patients that get irradiated blood, but it's not the same thing. Leukocyte reduction is for CMV prevention and HLA immunization prevention. It may lessen the risk of TAGVHD, but it's not enough by itself. Second, it does not work for CMV prevention. You need, as I've already said, leukocyte reduced or CMV negative products. It is not to be used for, for stem cell infusions. In other words, not you wouldn't want to irradiate the actual stem cell product, though a stem cell patient would get irradiated other blood products. Um, the, re the red cell membranes are somewhat damaged by irradiation. The potassium goes up dramatically, the free hemoglobin less so, and so some people have decided to wash irradiated blood products before they give them to babies. Um, the maximum storage for, uh, for products after they've been irradiated is 28 days in the United States or the regular expiration date, whichever comes first. You should have a very clear process for this and make sure that patients that need irradiated blood get irradiated blood. Some people have taken this to mean that universal irradiation is necessary. I want to mention this before we go. Nurses ask this, patients ask this. 
Are these products radioactive? Well, they are not. That is very clear, and there is no risk to the nurses, no risk to the patients as a result of getting these blood products. Okay, so we are almost at 10 minutes. I'm going to stop. Thank you. I hope this has been useful. Again, let me know if it is. Have a great day.